parenting teenagers is hard enough already, but it's even more difficult when you're trying to do that with the narcissist. So in today's video, I want to talk to you about two things, parallel parenting and specifically parallel parenting with teenagers. So first of all, again, I can't speak to everybody's situation. This is a mass broadcast. So please keep that in mind, you know, take what works for you and leave what doesn't. But if you are in a place where you know that you need extra support, you need extra help, including how to handle uh, holidays, how to handle various uh, times off with the children and the narcissist and what the schedule should look like and how to avoid having your entire holiday or vacation ruined, then I want you to consider applying to join my narcissistic detox intensive. In there, I have tons of resource involving parenting, involving preparing for court, how to present a best interest case in court, how to prepare for it, how to document your, your situation for court so that you are presenting your case in a legal manner when you go to a legal system. In order to do that, all you have to do is shoot me a text to 512-677. 9322, the word detox in your first name. And if you are outside of the US, I want you to send me an email. You can find my email address in the description below on this video. And without further ado, let's get into covering what you can do in terms of parallel parenting instead of co-parenting, especially when you are dealing with teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, when you have teenagers, it's really important that before you start analyzing the situation specifically that you are dealing with with your teens is that you take into account their personality because there are things that certain certain people are going to respond to certain things differently than other people based on their personality and their worldview. You could have three uh, teenagers raised in the same house, same circumstances, same parents, everything the same, and they're going to be interpreting and reacting to situations completely different. And that's because their worldviews are different. And it's before you do anything, before you start making changes or trying to implement any kind of thing, you need to take into account the, the way that your teen or teens specifically view the world and the way that they react to certain things and the way that they handle stress, the way that they handle conflict or disagreements, the way that they handle authority, the way that they interact and handle uh, uh, the, the different parenting styles that you and the, your ex have. You also want to take into account um, the way that or when this divorce or separation is taking place. If you have been separated from the narcissist for a long period of time, of course, this is going to be different in, in implementing a parallel parenting system because you've likely already been doing that uh, for a large portion of your child's life than if you have gotten divorced while your kids or separated while your children are teenagers or older, right? So that is going to impact the the situation for your children as well. So what I want you to do is really understand your your child, think about your child or children specifically, and the way that they naturally handle different situations and the way that they naturally will respond or react to those situations. Also think about the timing of the separation or divorce that you are going through, okay? Because that's going to impact uh, a lot of things. If you're if you're divorcing or separating while your child is a teenager, that's going to impact them a lot more, and you should ex expect a lot more resistance than if you separated when your kids were, you know, two to seven. Let's say that those children are going to have that be their norm, having two separate households uh, as their norm versus someone who is used to having both of their parents in the same home. Okay, so once you've taken that into consideration. I want you to understand what it means to do parallel parenting. Um, parallel parenting essentially means that you have your rules at your house and the, the other parent has their rules at their house and the children must learn how to uh, abide by these rules when they are with each of the parents. Obviously, this can be especially frustrating for teenagers who may be at, at their the the your ex's house the narcissist's house they're able to um maybe they don't have a bedtime or they don't have a curfew or they don't have they have a lot more freedom versus at your house maybe you have more more set rules and time frames that your children are allowed to do certain things in or have to do certain things by um in order for parallel parenting to truly work 
I want to back up to the divorce or separation part, because in order for parallel parenting to truly work, you need an extremely detailed final court order. So whether that comes through a settlement offer, through a trial, it really doesn't matter, but your final order needs to be extremely detailed. Most um, parenting plans that the court will put together, regardless of what state you're in, are broad. So it's going to be things like, you know, pick up uh, for the children or exchange times for the children is going to happen every other Friday. When you are dealing with a narcissist, that is not going to work. Okay, because the narcissist is going to switch days on you. Oh, this this week is my week and next week is going to be my week. And then the next week is going to, they will switch the days because it's not enforceable by law. In, in other words, law enforcement cannot get involved because it doesn't specifically say this date at this time is when the children need to come with you. So in order to get your children back, you're going to have to file an emergency motion, a contempt, uh, a contempt motion as well, letting the court know that they need to intervene in the, in the situation that you have with your ex, because they're not allowing you access to your children on your day. And then you're going to have to prove that, Hey, every other Friday, this is my Friday. They wouldn't let me have it. Here's all of the track. You're going to have to present your court, your, your case in court and make a legal argument as to why, you know, your ex is in contempt of court. It's going to be a long drawn out thing. So when you are parallel parenting, when you are parenting at all with a narcissist, you need a very detailed uh, court order. So instead of saying every other Friday, you need to have something that says, um, the, the first third and fifth Friday or whatever of the month the you know, the children go to this place at this time and will remain in that parent's custody until, you know, Monday, uh, the, the following Monday, you know, at this time, it needs to be very specific. If you have younger children, where that exchange is going to happen also needs to be extremely detailed. So in other words, you need to say like, um, the, the child's school parking lot or the, uh, gas station on the corner of such and such a street at such and such a time at three thirty PM. Right. And then you need to have caveats in there, um, for things like the spring break or the holiday schedule that the school is following. You know, the exception is except for during holiday breaks. And then you need to have a separate section that details what's happening during the holiday breaks. You cannot leave anything up to ambiguity. There can be nothing implied when you are parenting with a narcissist. And so, um, and so it's very important that you think this through whenever you are going through a custody situation, regardless of the age of your children. But go, getting back to parallel parenting, parallel parenting is not co-parenting. Co-parenting is when parents agree on what is best for the children and you guys have more or less the same rules, right? We agree that the kids' bedtime is 8.30 or whatever every single night, whether they're at your house or my house, and we all agree that this is going to be the way, or that the kids don't get to watch TV or that they don't have a cell phone until such and such an age. All these types of, or they don't eat certain foods or they don't hang out with certain people. All of those things are not negotiable with a narcissist. And in fact, when they know that you don't want the kids to have something, or you do want the kids to have something, they will specifically do the opposite of that. And you, while this can be very frustrating, it is important to understand that the bigger picture here is that you you will always have options. And instead of looking at this as the narcissist always tries to undermine, undermine my uh, parenting style, my parenting plan, my the thing that I want for my kids, instead of looking at it constantly from this victim standpoint is that understand if you want to make a change, start gathering up all of that evidence and prove a best interest case. I did an entire video on representing your children's best interest when it comes to court uh, already on my channel. So you can go check that out about how to formulate a best interest case so that you can understand what what things you need to be tracking and gathering uh, the evidence for. So while the narcissist might be undermining your parenting style, you need to understand that that can either be used to bring you down and, and make it look like, oh, I've always have got to do this with the narcissist and oh, they're always bring my life down. Or it can be used as uh, as fuel for your case. It can be used as evidence for your case if you if you want to make a change that badly. Okay, parallel parenting, again, is 
you know, you have your own rules, the narcissist gets to have their own rules, and the kids need to figure out those rules and abide by those rules whenever they're with that parent. Obviously, this is very confusing to children, and especially because the narcissist will have the tendency to change the rules on the kids, just like they did to you when you were in the relationship with the narcissist, right? One day it's okay to say this or to do this or to be this way. And then the next day it's, it's, uh, we're going into devaluation phase. We're going into the discard phase. We're going into the hoovering stage, whatever it is with the narcissist, they have the tendency to switch it. And that, that switching, uh, is establishing the trauma bond. So it's really important that you understand nothing that the narcissist does is, uh, on a whim. It's not by accident. They know what they are doing and they understand how to strengthen the trauma bond, which is ultimately what they want to do. And they will be doing that with your kids. So you might go through a period where the narcissist is just absolutely terrible to your kids. They put them down. They call them names. They tell them that they're liars. They try to gaslight them. All types of stuff can be happening. And then the next you know, week that the kids are with the narcissist, it's they've got all the toys. They're getting all the clothes and the shoes and the things. This is, that's a love bombing stage for the kids. I mean, it will look different for every narcissist and for every child. So if you have multiple kids that you share with the narcissist, one child could be in the, in the love bombing stage and another child could be in the devaluation phase. It's very important that you understand that the, the dynamics that you were facing when you were in a relationship with a narcissist are the same dynamics although they just look different they they are expressed differently with your kids and also understand multiple things could be going on uh, with your kids inside the narcissist home so you could have two children three children and all three of them be having very different experiences one child the golden child the one in the love bombing phase could be experiencing nothing but amazingness and they don't want to come to your house right because the narcissist lets them stay up till whenever or go do whatever they want or gives them money for x y and z and so it's really important that you take that into consideration before making decisions on how you're going to handle your kids right because your other child or other children could be experiencing something completely different from that child right they could hate it they don't want to go back they want to stay with you so Again, it's it's starting from the center and working out the problem into its completion before you start making or adjusting your parenting styles or expectations for your kids. On top of that, you need to understand you have teenagers, right? Teenagers are naturally trying to figure out who they are and where they fit in the world. They are trying to figure out you know, how do I make my own social structure? So they're trying to make their own bonds with kids at school or with other people in their community. They want to find their own place. They don't want to fall just under the identity or the place of you and the other parent. They want their own place. They want to have their own identity. They want to have their own sense of belonging, their own sense of community. And this is a natural phase for teenagers to go through. So you need to understand there's also the teenage aspect, which is that Kids want to do what they want to do at that age, and they are going to test the limits and test the bounds of your parenting, uh, your parenting expectations, your parenting styles during that phase, regardless of what's happening with you or the narcissist. You could have the most amazing marriage. You could have the most amazing home structure, and then all of a sudden your kids turn you know, 15, and they're rebelling, and they want to establish their own identity. So understand that when your kids are experience, expressing themselves like this and experiencing this um, this need to break away and, and establish something on their own, this does not reflect on you of being a bad parent, a neglectful parent. Um, I should have done X, Y, and Z things with them when they were kids, or I should have left the narcissist sooner or whatever. You know, there's no way to predict how your child specifically would, would handle becoming a teenager anyway. So try to stay out of the guilt and the shame aspect of parenting when your kids are doing more or less what they are biologically designed to do, right? That it is appropriate for them to try to figure out what their identity is apart from you two as the parents, regardless of how good or how bad of parents you are. So just take that into consideration as well. Now, when, um, 
one of the things that you will experience with a narcissist, regardless of the age of your children, is that the child does something, right? Let's say you have a teenager, the child, uh, your teen sneaks out, takes the car, whatever, but gets caught or gets in a uh, minor accident or whatever. The, the, the narcissist is going to blame you. How could this happen under your watch? This never happens under my watch. You know, you, this is a reflection of your parenting style. And I told you, I told you that you needed to do A, B, and C, and D, right? That's the typical narcissistic response. And you should also be aware that although it's a challenging time and you have a teen or multiple teens, you have multiple children maybe in your house, you're trying to move on with your life. Maybe you're starting a new career, whatever is going on. The narcissist is not going to all of a sudden become an understanding, supportive partner and co-parent for you. You need to still expect the narcissist to react as a narcissist. So take everything that the narcissist says with a grain of salt. In other words, don't try to get introspective about, oh, maybe they're right and it is my fault. And how come they, you know, my child respects the narcissist more or my child, you know, whatever. That's not the case. And don't allow the narcissist to get in your head and start causing you to make decisions and move out of a place of fear you need to always stay in a place of love where uh where you are making decisions that are in true alignment with you your goals and your values understand that you do need to respond to those messages right you do need to uh uh take a position when the narcissist sends you those types of messages that um is, is something just as simple as uh you know uh, Mark is a teenager or whatever. And these types of things should be expected. We should not, ex we should expect our children to be children and not, and while they are becoming adults, right? While they're young adolescents, we should also expect that they are not going to be perfect because they're human and, uh, and leave it at that, right? Don't try to put blame back on them. Well, you allowed him to have the car and you were the one who decided that this and that. Don't try to get in an argument simply state a fact and then let it be there. Okay. But you do need to respond to those messages. I just want you to make sure that you, uh, I want to make sure that you understand these are not things that you can just ignore. Some of them maybe you can, can ignore, but if the narcissist is constantly trying to put blame on you, it's likely the fact that they want to adjust the parenting order. Okay. And so they're going to be using uh, your responses or lack of responses um, as evidence for, for taking you back to court. Uh, long periods of litigation are extremely like excessive litigation. This is a very common tactic of the narcissist. And so even if you're out of, of court, um, the narcissist is just looking for a way to draw you back in into this energy uh, uh, sucking cycle. Okay. So moving, moving on, uh, it is important that you have ha, continue to maintain an open line of communication with your kids, regardless of how they are responding to that line being open to you right now. And what I mean by that is that let's say you've offered a million times to sit down and chat with your teen, or you've asked them, you know, if you ever want to talk, I'm always here. And you've offered these things and you've tried to like, find out what's really going on with them. And they never take you up on the offer and they're like, go away and don't talk to me or whatever they say back to you. It's important for you to recognize that your role as an adult in this situation is different than your child's role. And your role is to continuously have that space open to them. Okay, well, I just want you to know that the offer is here and I'm going to offer a million more times because I want you to understand that I'm not going anywhere. I love you. I care about you. I want to build a relationship, a connection with you that isn't just out of must, right? Because we're blood or because we're family and because I'm I'm the authority figure in this relationship dynamic. I want a relationship with you. I want to get to know you. I like who you are. And that's especially important when your child is experiencing the devaluation phase with the narcissist, right? If your child says that the other parent has said, you know, they're... Um, they're never going to amount to anything or that, you know, they're going to, God is looking at them and God's going to punish them all types of, I mean, I've heard pretty much anything that you can think of that, a, that is a, a damaging, horrible thing to say to your child. I've, I've heard my clients bring that to me. And, um, and again, expect the narcissist to be a narcissist, even with your children, unfortunately. And, but it is important that you affirm them in the opposite way. 
you are not a liar. You were made in the image of God. You are, you are designed to have your own identity and to stand up for truth, even when somebody doesn't want to hear it. Another thing that I encourage my clients to do is to ask, try to detach the child from that specific situation and ask questions in which they can really explore what they think is a healthy response to this situation. And this is especially important when you are dealing with the golden child or a child that's in the love bombing stage. And especially if there are other kids. So if they have siblings that are experiencing complete opposite things uh, that they are experiencing at the narcissist house, right? So especially if you have one child who who loves the going to the narcissist house because they get to do everything that they want. And they have siblings who hate it because they are belittled. They are berated. They are uh, they're just not treated with respect. They're put down at every turn. They are uh, questioned and all, et cetera, right? All the things that the narcissist does during a devaluation stage. So start asking them questions, you know, if, if, and, and take away the fact that they're dealing with a parent. Hey, if you had, if you had a group of three friends and one of them was putting down you know, your other two friends and you were there and you saw that happening, what, what do you think is an appropriate response in that situation? Or, um, or maybe you're one of the two, right. And your other friend is observing it, but they just don't step in. What, how would you feel about that? How would that make you feel? And then ask, once they respond to that, ask them, have you in any other situations, have you witnessed that, you know, have you been, have you been there when somebody has put, been putting down or berating somebody that you love? And what would you think about that person? You know, is that somebody that you want to hang out with? Is that somebody that you want to spend your time with? Start getting them to think about the, the things that are happening in the situation apart from the person or people involved in the situation. So when you put, pose it as a hypothetical, it, it allows the, the child to not think about it emotionally and what's in it for them, right? Especially again, the one that's getting love bomb because they're likely getting all the toys and all the clothes and all the freedom and whatever else it is that they need uh, or want. And you start making it just objective. Like, hey, this is a situation. What do you think is an appropriate response if you were to come across or experience this type of situation, this type of scenario, it helps the child start recognizing, oh, you know what? This is a situation that my mom just asked me about, or my dad just, you know, talked to me about. And so when, when it is happening this way, it starts getting the child to start seeing the full dynamic of what's happening. The other thing to keep in mind is that however long it took you to recognize a full grown adult to recognize you're dealing with a narcissist and to do something about it. Why are you putting so much pressure on your child to now all of a sudden see the light like you see the light now? It took you a long time to come to the conclusion that this person is who they are and they're not going to change. They do not want help. They are not interested in changing. They don't see anything wrong with with who they are, with with how they're acting. Do not expect your teenager who is going through a lot of internal biological changes to, to also start thinking rationally and see, oh yeah, this person is a narcissist and I should start standing up for myself against this person. They are a child. So it, I think it's really important that no matter how old your child is, even if they're 17, maybe they're 18, they're, they're still in high school, they're finishing up and they're living with you. It's important that you don't put on them the role of an adult when you, as a full-grown adult, took took a while to get to the point where you were ready to make a move, make a change. And that's something that I think that grace aspect, you know, think about all of the people who are probably telling you, you're with a narcissist, you need to do something about this, you need to change this, you need to get out of that situation. And you ignored their advice, even though you trusted them in every other way. To you, it's like, I've always been there for you. I've always provided for you. I've always, I always want the best for you. Why aren't you listening to me? <laughs> you see that it's, we're all experiencing a level of that. And it, and, and just know that there's a purpose in how this is unfolding for your child, right? The, the length of time that it is taking your child to come to the conclusion is likely that process is necessary, just as it was necessary for you, just as it was necessary for you who, who took a while to come to the conclusion, this is a narcissist and I need to make a change, right? You could have been saying, yeah, he's a narcissist. She's a narcissist, but you didn't do anything about it for a while. Understand 
that that is happening um, with your child. Another thing, I know that this is getting to be a really long video and I want to wrap this up pretty quick here, but one thing that I do want to in enforce to you is to not criticize the other parent. Teenagers, especially if you have rebellious teenagers, are looking for a way to pit you two even more against each other in a way that's going to benefit them. Remember, your children are, uh, are learning all the time learning. They are observing what is what is a cultural norm, what is an acceptable uh, behavior in, in your family unit, in your fa family dynamic. They are looking and reading these situations. They are, again, they're trying to establish their own place, their own space in society. They want their own, uh, they want their own place of belonging. So they are watching these dynamics and they will definitely be looking for an opportunity to pitch you two against each other even more so in a way that would benefit them, okay? And, and make no mistake that that is happening. Your children are observing how a narcissist works and they will try to experiment using narcissistic tactics even against you, even against each other, even against their siblings. You need to understand that they are learning that. And instead of getting all worked up about like, I don't want my child doing that, some some children, some personality types are going to have to see, hey, there's real consequences when you try to behave this way. And as much as you want belonging and as much as you want acceptance and as much as you're looking to establish your own identity and your own social uh, construct, your own social network and and your own place of of security in in a community, those behaviors will have real consequences. And some people, some personality types are more prone to learn through experience than they are through advice. You need to accept that. Going back to the core structure is know your child. What is their personality type? And understand that that's going to be the way that they are experiencing and observing the world. Okay. And that's how they learn. So instead of getting all bent out of shape again about like, I need to put a stop to this immediately. Some things, yes, obviously you need to put a stop to immediately, but some, sometimes, a lot of times when you see this type of behavior, you need to, to treat that behavior accordingly. I will not be right. You will not gaslight me in this situation. You will not rewrite my history. You will not tell me what I did or did not experience. You, you do need to set boundaries with your own ch children and not let them uh, take away the ground that you have gained from the other parent, from the narcissist parent that you have either divorced or separated from. So you do need to be aware of that as well, that there are going to be times when your children are, uh, are utilizing the behavior from the narcissist that they've been observing when they've been with the narcissist. Teenagers are trying to establish their own autonomy so that they can make their own choices, right? And so when you can start engaging them, ask them questions as opposed to just telling them, yes, of course, have boundaries. Yes, of course, have rules. This is your home. You don't want, you don't want your home ruined, destroyed, whatever, but you do need to start asking, engaging questions so that you, it, it, for two reasons. One, it gives them, it starts getting them to think in a different way. And number two, it's reinforcing to them that, hey, I care about how you feel, what you think. I'm, I want a dialogue. I want to hear what you think about this. Teenagers are already going to be rebelling against authority, most of them, right? Which I've already stated before. And they are going to look at this conflict between you and the narcissist as a way to have their voice heard. Uh, and especially when, because they view you as, as, um, an authority figure, especially like disagree and rebel uh, against the authority, right? Because especially if they heard the other parent, the narcissist bashing you, they're going to look for a way to make that into a beneficial situation for them. And so, um, and so especially if the other parent is getting their way, like if you're still in the middle of court, be mindful of this. If the other parent has more momentum, the child is likely to favor that parent. If you're having more momentum, they're likely to favor you. Okay, it, you, you just need to understand that energy, again, is a real thing, which I have a ton of videos talking about that. But if you think that your children are not for a second swayed by that, you really need to go back to re-looking at the way that you are viewing this entire dynamic power dynamic because if you don't you're going to be putting too much emphasis on something else when it really should be over here right um and so 
it, again, it's very important to have a very detailed court order, uh, the approved parenting plan, and then that gives you the control to say yes or no to decisions around your children's best interest. Mm -hmm. And if there's something that's truly uh, working against the children's best interest, even after you have a final court order, you need to start documenting that so that you can go back and get that amended. It is a process. It is a, there is no quick fix. There is no quick and easy three-step solution. This is something that you have to be um, diligent about uh, implementing every single time that you're around your child. Because remember that what whatever you you give up on, right? And that's another thing is picking your battles, understanding that. But the, if it's an important thing and you give up on it, you need to understand that that's a gap the narcissist is happy to fill. The narcissist is happy to come in and fill that space with what they believe is right and teach your children a, a different type of behavioral set of patterns and values than maybe you want them to have. So while it is challenging, remember that this is going to be the most important job that you will ever have. Nothing else matters as much as being a parent to your children. And also remember that those children were given to you specifically. God didn't make anybody else their parents. That is your role first, your spiritual role. And so understanding that you are completely equipped, you are completely graced to fill that position uh, can, can help remind you that as, although it feels overwhelming, it may sometimes even feel hopeless that you truly were appointed to do this job. You were already chosen to do this job and that you are fully able and capable of completing that task. So I hope this video helps you. And if you have any comments, questions, suggestions for other parents, you want to connect with other parents, please comment down below. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel. And if you're wondering why you feel so crazy after you have left the narcissist, even though you know that's the right thing to do for you, for your family, for your future, I want you to check out this video next in which I describe exactly why you're feeling that way.